most of us in this room consider ourselves to be socialists of one kind or another, and all of us consider ourselves to be anti-imperialists. And most of us have been talking about the global crisis of capitalism for most of our adult lives. And there's no doubt that capitalism is in crisis. Many of the contradictions of capitalism have become acute. We can show that in many, many different ways, and we can show it by the numbers. For example, the notional value of derivative contracts around the world is between 10 and 20 times the gross product of the entire world economy. Surely that is a number that is an indication of grave crisis, and it portends catastrophic events to come. Certainly, we can see that capitalism is in a crisis of legitimacy. Young people don't believe in capitalism anymore. We can show that by the numbers, too. Polls show that about half of young people have a favorable view of socialism or consider themselves to be socialists. They may not be clear about what socialism is, but they do know that they oppose the system of capitalism that they live under. They don't think that these oligarchs have a right to rule them and to determine what kind of lives they'll lead. That is a crisis of legitimacy. But crises of legitimacy don't by themselves bring down a system. It's simply a sign that the people are not happy. Mass unhappiness may bring down an administration, but it doesn't necessarily change the system one bit. And we see that year after year after year in this bourgeois duopoly system. The people grow tired, tired of endless wars. The people of the United States are certainly tired of the endless wars that have multiplied during the 21st century. The polls show that the people are tired. People that call themselves Democrats and people that call themselves Republicans, all of them are tired of these endless wars. We see this war weariness in what we used to think would be surprising places. Back in 2016, when Donald Trump was running for president, he claimed to be opposed to US wars of regime change. And he claimed that he wanted to pursue relationships of peace and good relations with Russia. He didn't mean that. But he did say that. He said he wanted peaceful relations with Russia and a halt to US regime change wars. And his constituency, a constituency that has historically been the most pro-war, didn't bat an eye when he said those things. Now, maybe that's because Trump supporters were instead looking forward to bashing black people and Mexicans here at home. I don't know what was their motivation, but at any rate, Trump's supporters seem to accept, if not embrace, his peace rhetoric during the 2016 campaign. And that is what scared the hell out of the fellow oligarchs, Trump's fellow oligarchs, and scared the hell out of the national security state. Because if Trump's Republican supporters weren't gung-ho for endless war, then where is the mass constituency for war? Maybe, maybe that constituency does not exist. So the national security state was in a deep quandary. They were very upset and Frankly, they were confused, and you could see the confusion in their actions. If Trump was serious about pursuing good relations with Russia,
then how could the U.S. keep up its pressure to freeze Russia out of Europe and keep the Ukrainian Nazi regime in a constant state of war against its own Russian-speaking population? The war party in the U.S., and that war party is both Republican and Democrat, had worked hard to put the U.S. back on a constant war footing after George Bush was forced to pull out of Iraq. Their instrument in this, their instrument to get the endless wars back on track was Barack Obama, who fooled the people into believing that he was a peace candidate and then continued all of George Bush's wars and started a whole series of his own using Islamic jihadists as his foot soldiers in his new wars in the Middle East. Donald Trump, of course, was never a peacenik. It may be that he behaved that way in 2016 only because, well, Barack Obama was for regime change, and maybe he'll say he's against re regime change. And Barack Obama destroyed relationships with Russia, so maybe he'll say he's going to make good relations with Russia. Who knows what goes on in Trump's mind? I'm sure that it is a place that you wouldn't want to visit. <laughs> But what happened was that this bipartisan war party and with the national security state in the lead, they were in a panic. They decided that Donald Trump couldn't be trusted with the keys to the empire. So they all piled into Hillary Clinton's overstuffed campaign tent. And for the first time ever, current and former heads of the CIA got directly involved in presidential election politics, and they became involved as Democrats. When Trump won his victory in the Electoral College, the CIA produced a document claiming that the Russians and WikiLeaks had tried to rig the election. In doing this, in doing this, the Democrats and the national security state created a real crisis of legitimacy for the whole bourgeois democratic system. And they did that in order to delegitimize not just the Trump administration, but all dissent in the United States. The Democrats became the most aggressive war party and the party of censorship and the party of fear-mongering. They became the new McCarthyite party. So now, the corporate electoral duopoly consists of a Republican white man's party whose organizing principle is white supremacy and a Democratic warmongering party whose organizing principle these days is bashing Russia and sliming dissidents as dupes of Russia. And at the core of that Democratic Party is Black America, which has historically been the most pro-peace constituency in the nation and at the forefront of leftish dissent. So we have a huge contradiction at the core of the base of the Democratic Party, which is now the McCarthyite warmongering party. That new posture for the Democratic Party has created a bizarre, bizarre black democratic politics. It has made the black misleadership class even more ridiculous and more cartoonish than they have ever been. The most pitiful is Maxine Waters. She's the black congresswoman from Los Angeles who not so long ago was denouncing the CIA for bringing cocaine into our city. The poor corporate media back then called her crazy, but Maxine was in her right mind back then. 
She was then in sync with the thinking of most black Americans. But now she really is a loon, strutting around, waving American flags, and encouraging white people to call her Auntie Maxine. As if she is oblivious to the historical connotations of that word. Auntie is female for uncle, as in Uncle Tom. <laughs> Maxine Waters and most of the rest of the black democratic political class have become aunties and uncles for U.S. empire. That is in direct opposition to the totality of black American politics, which has always been for social justice and for peace. But such are the contortions that the black misleadership class must engage in to find its place in the chow line of the ruling class during this crisis of legitimacy. The turn towards war by the black misleadership class was set in motion not by Trump, who is anathema in black America, but by Barack Obama, the first black president. Before Obama, and for all of black history on this continent, black people have been supremely skeptical of the motives of the U.S. government and skeptical of its wars against people of color around the world. War propaganda, the demonization of people targeted by the United States, did not work among black Americans. We knew that the U.S. powers that be lied lied about us, and that it was probably lying about the people that it was invading, and that it was bombing, and that it was demonizing in its corporate media. Our anti-war posture was a homegrown posture, because we were the eternal and constant victims of U.S. coercive power, the white mobs, and the police, and the white media. You don't have to be as old as I am to remember when in black conversations about U.S. wars, it wasn't what are we doing over there, but what are they doing in other people's countries. We did not identify with the U.S. war machine. Black organizations were early opponents of the Vietnam War. SNCC was anti-war before the first U.S. troop buildup. Malcolm opposed all of this country's wars. Martin Luther King broke with his sometimes ally, Lyndon Johnson, to denounce the war. The Black Panther Party proclaimed revolutionary solidarity with the Vietnamese and with all people struggling against U.S. imperialism. The heavily black U.S. Army in Vietnam refused to be cannon fodder. Black troops fought pitched battles with white military police in Da Nang and other cities in Vietnam. They burned down, burned down the military prison in Long Bin because U.S. military justice is just like here. It's mass black incarceration. They took out officers and NCOs in what became called fraggings. Black troops made the U.S. Army in Vietnam useless. By 1970, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were demanding an all-volunteer army so that they could recruit the kind of soldiers that would do their bidding. In the late 60s, my unit, the 82nd Airborne Division, was 60% black, and a lot of other units were that black. By the time of the Iraq War, the 82nd was the lightest, whitest division in the U.S. Army. Blacks still made up 20% of the U.S. military, but they were now put mainly in support units, not on the line in the infantry or the other combat arms. The U.S. military knows full well that black America has never been gung-ho for war. Near the beginning of the Iraq war, black mothers began using 
or rather urging their sons and daughters not to volunteer. The Army's top brass was thrown into a panic. Black enlistment dropped dramatically. They called it the Black Mother's Strike against the war. Two weeks before George Bush invaded Iraq, the Zogby polling organization conducted a survey. They asked this question, would you be in favor of a U.S. invasion of Iraq if it resulted in the death of thousands of Iraqi civilians? Big majorities of whites said, yes, go ahead, invade. 16% of Hispanic Americans said they supported an invasion even if it killed thousands of civilians. But only 7% of black Americans were for an invasion that would wreak such carnage. 7% is about as marginal as you can get. Almost unanimously, black people did not want to go into a war that wreaked havoc on civilians because they identified with Iraqis as people, an identification that appears missing with too many white Americans. Blacks were overwhelmingly in opposition throughout the Iraq war, but then came Obama. And for the first time, black people identified with the commander in chief of the U.S. Empire. When Obama threatened to bomb Syria, supposedly in retaliation for a chemical weapons attack, and that attack was actually staged by the Islamic jihadists that Obama had deployed in foot soldiers, uh, as foot soldiers in Syria. Another poll was taken right after that, after Obama said, I'm thinking about bombing. And that poll showed for the first time in history that blacks, blacks were more in favor of bombing Syria than white people were. Only a minority of all Americans favored that bombing. Only a minority of blacks, only a minority of whites, only a minority of Hispanics. But 38% of blacks did go along with Obama versus about 36% of whites. Uh, I think I got those, uh, those numbers correct. Even though black majorities were not in favor of Obama's war in Syria, his very presence in the White House created a huge distortion in black views on war and peace. For that, and for many other good reasons, we at Black Agenda Report were very, very glad to see Obama go. We, we hoped, we hoped that black America would return to its historical consensus in favor of social justice and peace. And we are still confident that that consensus remains largely intact among the masses of black Americans. However, the Democrats, who are now the most aggressive of the war parties, have succeeded in linking Donald Trump to Russia and then lumping all critics of U.S. war making with Russia and thereby with Trump. That is the evil genius of Russiagate, a CIA concocted lie designed to maintain the momentum of Obama's military offensive around the planet, to maintain that offensive without Obama. Fortunately, we now have a fighting organization that upholds the historical black consensus against imperial war and consents, con connects that consensus to the militarized oppression of black and brown people here at home. The Black Alliance for Peace fills a huge void, a huge void that has existed since the loss of black voices for peace. Russiagate presents the peace movement in general 
and the black anti-war movement in particular with unique difficulties. The black misleadership class is all in with the CIA and all in with the Pentagon. But the mass of black folks still identify with the oppressed people of the world and see themselves as among those globally oppressed. Black people remain anti-imperialist at their core, and they are more socialist than any other ethnicity, and we can show that by the numbers too. And that is a winning combination. Power to the people. by the intelligence community and that they um, were involved in trying to uh, get his get him to be favored in the Democrats and then others are saying that's because they think Trump would beat him. Uh, do you think that's all a big lie made up by the Oh, it's, it's, tra it's tra yes. It's transparent. It's, it, as I said, this is evil genius. Uh, what they, uh, what, what the headlines that we saw I believe it was yesterday, uh, linked both Trump, again, he's been, they've been linking him for four years, linked Trump and in people's minds, Bernie, together with Russia and with each other. And that is designed, especially among black folks, to taint Bernie, Trump, Russia, a triangle. angle. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite obvious what they're doing. Uh, you could come up with that kind of uh, transparent uh, kind of signaling in uh, any PR or advertising uh, agency. Certainly the CIA is good enough to do that. I could come up with that one if I was on the other side. <laughs> Another question? Yes. Thank you. Glenn, I wanted to ask you about the, um, in Black and General Report, often a lot of the writers uh, seem to imply or even outright say that a, a first step in uh, revolutionizing the electoral process is to defeat the Democratic Party. Your thoughts and explanation, elaboration on it. Defeat, no, that, that defeat has the connotation of defeated at the polls, and uh, that's not our job. What, what we've been saying, and I think uh, all of us have, uh, agree on this, is that there must be a dissolution of the duopoly. And in this duopoly trap, uh, it is truly a trap for black people. Uh, white people, uh, since, there is, since there are only two parties, one of them, as I said, uh, is the white man's party. There's always been a white man's party, by the way, uh, in the United States. That is a party uh, whose organizing principle uh, is white supremacy, uh, and that is their, their advertising. Uh, <coughs> The Republican Party has been the white man's party certainly since 1968. Uh, it is no different under Trump, except Trump substituted the dog whistles for, for the dog whistles, uh, the just blatant uh, racist uh, 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 wording, uh, so that so that the uh, white supremacist constituents of that party uh, would get a quality product uh, rather than a watered down uh, product but it's still the white man's party. And in this system, there is no place for black people except the Democratic Party, and they know it. So it becomes a trap. White people can decide to be in the racist party or the Democratic Party, uh, but black people have no choice whatsoever. And what that means, and that's horrible for everybody, because that means that the most left-leaning constituency in the country, and black people are that constituency is trapped in a corporate party so that in primaries most black folks vote for the candidate that they believe is best suited to defeat the white man's party. That is, the priority of most black primary voters is not to express their own quite leftish political views, their own leftish worldview, and certainly they're not, not their own self-determinationist worldview, but 
to beat the white man's party. That becomes everything. And they perceive, most folks perceive, that the strongest candidate is the one with the most money. And the one with the most money is, of course, the most pro-corporate candidate. So we have this crazy uh, phenomenon where the most left-wing constituency in the Democratic Party backs the most right-wing uh, candidates, you see, and can be bought off, and their representatives <coughs> are getting bought off by uh, the truckload by Bloomberg, you see. Uh, that is the dynamic that is set in motion with this duopoly. So uh, we, the, that, that must, the duopoly must be broken up, and that means uh, the breakup of the Democratic Party. Now, uh, some of us had thought that this breakup in the Democratic Party would come from the left that this time around, uh, the uh, Sandinistas, uh, after enduring uh, who knows what uh, they're going to do to try to uh, sabotage him this time around, uh, that they would finally uh, say we see the, uh, the fruitlessness of pursuing uh, political power through this party. But I think that it's more likely at this stage we, these surprises just come hot and heavy. Uh, that Bloomberg, no matter how well he does uh, himself as a candidate, uh, we know that Bloomberg is right now in the process, it's well along, of buying the Democratic Party, of using his billions to, uh, to create structures, billionaire funded structures, uh, that make sure that the Democratic Party is a truly hostile environment for anything to the left of Nancy Pelosi. That is what Bloomberg's project is. Uh, they saw uh, that uh, Bernie Sanders' domestic agenda, I don't want anybody uh, here, uh, when I say positive things about Bernie's domestic agenda, to think that Black Agenda Report uh, is endorsing Bernie Sanders. Uh, he's an imperialist pig still. But his domestic, his domestic agenda is uh, an austerity breaker. Uh, and his issues are super majority issues in the Democratic Party. And the oligarch class has even better data than uh, the commercial polls that we see. They know damn well uh, what's written on the wall. And so the Bernie campaign has panicked the oligarchs and their most political uh, uh, personage, uh, Bloomberg, one of the most arrogant personages among them, has decided that he's going to secure the Democratic Party uh, from uh, making it immune uh, to those kinds of super majority uh, tendencies within the base. Uh, so I think, and, and he cannot do that secretly. You don't mean move uh, billions of dollars secretly. Uh, he already has uh, announced uh, that he has pledged and paid the salaries of 500 or, uh, organizers uh, and administrators, and he pays top dollar, uh, from now till November, till the November election. He's pledged them to the DNC. He claims they won't be his uh, campaign operatives, but working for the DNC. Uh, uh, that's more, by far, operatives than the DNC can afford. Uh, so we know what is happening. He's already buying uh, the mechanism. And so there will be no place for more AOCs uh, in the Democratic Party when Bloomberg uh, gets through with it. Folks will see the handwriting on the wall. So I think the dissolution or the breakup of the Democratic Party, uh, in short, is going to come from the right. Uh, and we won't have to depend on uh, the Bernieites uh, finally making their break. Who knows, they probably never will. Uh, but I think the Bloombergs will force them out. We're gonna have one last question from Matthew Hoffman, and then um, Yusuf is gonna come up and tell us where the, the workshops are gonna be, and, uh, um, and we'll move to the workshops. Glenn, thank you for your clarity and vision and for being equal-handed on both those political parties we spoke about. But there is another, there is another party out there. Uh, th there is a Green Party. Um, I'm running for U.S. Senate in New Jersey on the Green Party ticket. 
So my question to you is, how do we take the movement forward of the Green Party and connect it with those people who have no place to go within the Democratic Party so that we can take advantage of this moment to build as strong a coalition as possible and give people another place to go? Well, that's, that's a very good question, and I have no, no magic formula, and of course I'm, I'm not in the Green Party, uh, but, but uh, I believe uh, that this exit uh, from the Democratic Party, which is inevitable not necessarily before the election, but inevi inevitable very soon, uh, the Green Party should have that as its utmost uh, priority. How are you going to absorb, small as you are, uh, these hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions, uh, who will be leaving in disgust and uh, with all the energy uh, that people who are livid uh, have, at least in the beginning stages of their ferocious anger. Uh, I don't know, but that's going to be uh, number one besides staying on the ballot for your party. All right. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you all for